Welcome again to the Comic Book Historians Podcast. I'm Alex Strand with my co-host, Jim Thompson. Today, we have a very special guest, Mr. Carl Potts. Carl has many titles to his name, as well as professor, editor, inker, layout artist. He worked uh, in the early 70s with uh, Neil Adams in continuity, and then also went on to Marvel and other projects. Carl, thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. All right, so Carl, I always like to start at the very beginning, and I know you were born in uh, the early 50s and uh, in Oakland, California. I had read that you'd, you were raised in the, the San Francisco Bay Area, but also in Hawaii. Can you kind of break down when you were at different places? Yeah, I was born, uh, I was a Navy brat. I was born at Oak Knoll Naval Hospital in the Oakland Hills and uh, lived in various places around the East Bay Area until I was four, I believe it was. And my dad was stationed on Oahu in Honolulu. And so we lived for two and a half years in Navy housing in Honolulu. So I went to kindergarten and first grade at Nimitz Elementary School in Honolulu, Ah. which recently, on a recent trip to Hawaii, I visited is still open, still there, still operating. It's the only school I went to from elementary through high school that is still open and operating. It's it's, uh, very strange, but the first one I went to is the only one still standing. And then uh, after that, we moved back to the Bay Area and pretty much stayed there for most of my life until I moved to New York. We did have one short six-month stint in San Diego when I was in second grade. My dad was posted down there for a short time. Then we came and, back to the Bay Area. And what did he do in the Navy? He was in the Navy? Yeah, he was a 20-year man. He was a chief of damage control, which means that... Uh, you know, if there was any ship damage, including battle damage during, he was in World War II, that deal with that. But often that also meant that they were the master carpenters. So he was an amazing carpenter. Uh, uh, but he was on a seaplane tender, a PBY uh, seaplane tender. So they would often have to rendezvous with seaplanes that were out of fuel or damaged in the middle of the ocean and uh, go out there and try and get them up in the air again. Yeah, my dad was on the Santa Fe and I think the Wasp during the war as well. Hmm. So. So I, I know all those stories. <laughs> Tell a little bit about your upbringing and your, your you know, I, you said your dad's in the Navy, but what, what else can you tell us? Well, my father and my mother met shortly after World War II in the Bay Area. My mother and her whole family had been prisoners of the Japanese in the Philippines during the war for over three years. And even though my maternal grandmother, her mother, was Japanese, born and raised, she had married an American and considered herself an American from that point on. So they mm. they were in the Philippines when the Japanese took over, and they took all of the Allied civilians and put them in prison camps. The biggest one was Santa Tomas University campus. So it was this big square city block with big walls around it that was in the heart of Manila. And at first, they didn't want to. They hated my grandmother for marrying the enemy. But they weren't going to put her, a Japanese woman, civilian, in the prison camp. But she was a tough lady. I didn't realize when I was growing up, she was just grandma to me, but she worked her way up the chain of command to the general in charge of Manila and convinced him she was an American by choice. And he finally relented and wrote her a pass to get into the prison camp to be with her husband and her children. And as far as I know, she's the only Japanese civilian voluntarily imprisoned by the Japanese during the war, at least in the Philippines. But they were in there for over three years being progressively starved. And, you know, occasionally the Kempai Tai, the secret police would come in and haul people out and they'd never be seen again. And it was really brutal stuff. And um, when MacArthur came back, he sent uh, a force called the Flying Column uh, 100 miles behind Japanese lines to get into Manila and free those prisoners. And if they hadn't been successful, I wouldn't exist because my mother was in that camp. Oh. So that's actually... Um, Part of a giant World War II graphic novel I'm currently working on that will be published by the Naval Institute Press called The Flying Column that I I wrote. And I originally started doing layouts for, and Bill Reinhold was going to do all the finished art on, but it turned out that I was just not producing the layouts fast enough, so Bill took over, and he's doing all the art on them. And he's doing it in ink wash that we then turn into sepia tone, so we'll have that 1940s look. Oh, and that's that's exciting. But after the war, uh, they, they, or while the war is still going on, my grandfather, who was from Alabama, took his Japanese wife and all his half-Japanese children to his family in Alabama while the war is still going on. So my poor younger uncle got in fights every day at, in high school for the, <laughs> the rest of the year for about, for about a month because uh, all the bullies there would jump. Unfortunately, he'd been uh, taking boxing lessons in Manila. But my mother and some of her sisters and eventually most of the rest of the family moved to the Bay Area and 
there was where she met my father, and they decided to get married. And back then, even uh, right after the war, there were still these laws that uh, if you were half Japanese or more, you couldn't marry a Caucasian person mm. in California. So they had to drive up to Washington State where the laws were different in order to get married. And then he got posted around. He was in uh, Guam where my sister was born and then back to the Bay Area where I was born and we took off from there. But after we moved back from Hawaii, we were basically in San Leandro, California, which is below Oakland and above Hayward. And I pretty much grew up there until I was about 21 or two, and I decided I was going to move to New York and become a comic book artist uh, very naively. I'd never even, even in college, I it was close enough that I didn't even move out of the home, so I'd never lived on my own. And in the Bay Area at that time, we're living some professional comic book people who had got tired of New York and decided to move to the beautiful Bay Area, including Jim Starlin and Alan Weiss and Frank Brenner and Particularly Weiss and Starlin were very, very nice to me and always invited me over when I had new art samples to show to give me critiques. Mm -hmm. And eventually, Starlin got assigned to do basically over a four-day weekend, a a draw a whole issue of Richard Dragon Kung Fu Fighter for Denny O'Neill, who was editing it at DC. Mm -hmm. Uh, They needed it in a rush, and so he pulled me in to help on some backgrounds and background characters, and Alan Weiss helped him pencil the, the main stuff. And well, Alan Milgram make the whole thing to try and make it look somewhat uniform. But Lord knows Milgram had a, his hands full with my stuff back then, <laughs> trying to make that come up to the standards. But anyhow, so when I told Starlin I was going to move to uh, New York, he asked me if I knew anybody out there. And I said, no, I did not. And he said, hmm, I'm going to make a call. So he ended up calling Al Milgram and Walt Simonson, who shared an apartment in Forest Hills, Queens, and said, um, I'm going to, you know, if this kid comes out here, out there, uh, would you guys uh, be willing to put him up while he gets his feet under him? They said, mm-hmm. sure. They never met me. They had no idea who I was. They just took Starlin's word that, uh, you know, I was a decent folk. And mm-hmm. so I flew out there and arrived on a red eye and made it to the apartment building in the late morning. And I didn't realize those guys kept nocturnal hours. So I actually woke them up at around 11 in the morning. <laughs> and it turned out that, you know, not only was I kind of starstruck, you know, suddenly hanging out with Simonson and Milgram, but that living in that same building where Bernie Wrightson and Howard Chaikin, and they're always palling around all day long. Right. That's and, great. And I was just like, you know, I, I didn't know what the hell to do. <laughs> I was just flabbergasted. I was suddenly in the mix of with all these people. And, and this Starlin, was in 1974, right? Five, summer 75. 75. Okay. And if, if you recall uh, your history, that is right when Atlas collapsed. So all the people have been gone yep. to Atlas to work were rushing back to Marvel and DC to try and pick up work. So that was like the worst possible time to try and break into the business. Uh, now, and, before th- before that, though, you had made some other contacts, and including meeting Neil Adams when you were still in California, right? In 73, at your yeah. first San Diego Comic-Con. Talk about that for a few minutes. Yeah, I drove my Pinto hatchback from the Bay Area down to San Diego, and then the convention was being held at a motel near the airport. That's how what, far long ago this thing was. Hmm. And uh, the, the major guests there that year were Neil, Jack Kirby, and Carmine Infantino. Hmm. And I had a portfolio of, you know, kind of really, really lame art. Most, and not even any continuity stuff. It was mostly typical mistake for, you know, fans trying to show their work. It was uh, pinup type stuff. Hmm. And I worked up the nerve to show it to Neil. Neil looked at it and said, hmm, handed it back to me, said, it's not even worth commenting on it, turned around to walk away. And I don't know how I worked up the nerve, but I, I, and I just say, well, could you at least tell me what to work on? So he turned around for a minute and he proceeded to name every aspect of drawing and composition and storytelling and, you know, layout, everything and anatomy, all the, everything and said, you know, if you worked real hard for 18 months, I might be willing to look at it again. So when I got to New York, I took him up on his offer a little bit later. But first, uh, Starlin would go back to New York once in a while to, you know, arrange for his next batch of projects or whatever. So he kindly timed one of his visits with my visit back there. So my second day in New York, he took me up to the Marvel offices, which were the ones on Madison Avenue at that point. And, you know, introduced me around and I got to show my work. And I sold my first piece to Archie Goodwin, of all people, who was editing the black and white 
magazines at the time. And for, for Marvel. Yeah, and there was a science fiction magazine that uh, he had that he wanted to get a piece of art for the subscription ad. So he bought my pencils for something and then Simonson inked that. So my first professional job selling something, I get Walt Simonson ink in it. And nice. aren't you good, good when buying it? That, you, know, my, you know, my head was on, you know, in the clouds. That was your first professional at Marvel, but you had done a lot of some fanzine work before that, including the, um, the one that you did with, I think you met these guys at the same convention that you met Adams, right? The, uh, the venture people. Yeah, uh, who are very important in your career. I mean, they come up yeah, periodically. Again again. Yeah, yeah. At that convention, I made connections with other artists. Ironically, I had to go to San Diego to meet a bunch of other artists from the Bay Area who I didn't even know, who were also into comics and trying to break in. And that included Steve Lealoa and Al Gordon, and then Frank Sirocco, Gary Winnick, and Brent Anderson, who were all from the San Jose area in the South Bay. And so that was, that's my initial connection with uh, all those folks. And like up until that point, I was in total ignorance that, you know, there were a lot of other people in a similar situation and mindset as I was living near me. So Uh, tell us a little bit about Venture. Venture was um, basically Frank Sirocco and Gary Winnick's fanzine. And they were also good friends with uh, Brent Anderson. So he always had work in there as well. I did just a little bit of work for them. But when they heard I was going to move to New York and try and you know, break into the mainstream comics. They kind of used me to try and help tease uh, Neil Adams to do a cover for them, which was, you know, kind of, uh, I think the fact that they got the, that cover out of Adams with me kind of tickling uh, the subject matter from the inside there at Continuity, I ended up getting that original art for a while, but then uh, Gary Winnicka was so, you know, proud of that piece because it had Neil Adams drawing a character he created that I ended up giving it back to him. But let's see where I was going. I'm, I'm, I'm and Sirocco and, and uh, Winnick actually ended up, did you get them, help get them jobs at Continuity at some point? Yeah, a bit. Uh, they came out and uh, decided they were going to, the year after I got out there and I got established at Continuity, they decided they were going to try and do the same thing. So I introduced them around and Neil and Dick Giordano liked them enough to, you know, have them work up there for a while. And then a year or two, Brent Anderson came out with them too, but Brent, I think, was more freelancing as opposed to just, you know, working up at Continuity, but he was there a lot. Then they all went back to California for a little while. And then a year or so later, Brent Anderson came back out, this time accompanied by Joe Chido. And Tony Sammons, I believe, too, came out somewhere along the way. Oh, um, okay. Oh, because he, uh, he did a, a, some work for uh, Venture, too. Yeah, I know I he, so. he, inked, he inked something, um, yeah. I remember. So um, Tony, I think, was not from the Bay Area, though. I think he was like from Arizona or, or somewhere, still out west, but not the Bay Area. But anyhow, before I, I, I got to continuity, um, when Starlin was still showing me around the Marvel offices, he took me into the British reprint department where the editor was busy chopping all the 22 page stories in half for the British weekly market. And they needed new splash pages for the second halves. And so they'd often give the new people a shot there. And I ended up going out of there with a handful of assignments for new splash pages for the, the British reprints. And that's right. Cause I, Tom Orzachowski got, that's where he started. Um, mm over at Marvel, too, I think, as I remember. And, I, uh, who, I, and you knew him as well, right? He was one of the uh, people. Yeah, in the Bay Area, there was, uh, late. in addition to Weiss, Starlin, and Renner, Steve Englehart moved out there, and Orzakowski was there. And for a while, a lot of them had this uh, house they were renting all together in, in the Berkeley Hills, which was really nice. But I'm not sure if there was anybody else that moved out there or not from, from back east. Now, were you, you had started, you'd become interested in comics going back to early days. You were interested in comics, and I had read somewhere that you had really started with DC War titles. That those were ones that you, were kind of your first love. Is that, was that accurate? Well, I'd been reading comics before then, just about anything I could get, get my hands on, I'd read. And then, you know, if I was homesick from, you know, elementary school, my mom if she went to the drugstore, would, you know, go to the spinner rack and grab a handful of things, usually stuff I wouldn't normally have bought for myself, like Lucille Ball comics and, you know, <laughs> no, well. things like that. But occasionally she'd get to me, but I'd read them all. I just love the form and, and visual storytelling. But 
when I started uh, mowing lawn and getting my own money, yeah, I'd go down and uh, usually it would be DC war titles. They, um, you know, the art, that's when, you know, the differences in the art started really jumping out at me and looking at people like Kurt Kubert and Irv Novick and Russ Heath, you know, the art just looks so amazing to me. Mm-hmm. And, and then when you grew, then you ended up sharing, you were in the same space as, as Russ Heath when you went to continuity, right? Yeah. He was like right yeah. behind you? Yeah, Russ was sitting at the table uh, behind mine in the um, the main front room at Continuity. And did you did you meet did you work with Schubert at all? I met him a few times. The only time I really worked with him at all is uh, later on when I was executive editor at Marvel. Or at that point, that was that silly period when they had five of us being simultaneous editors in chief, and he was doing new new tour a new Abraham Stone work for Epic. And so I worked with him a little bit on that. And Irv Novick, I don't believe I ever met. But I, when I used to go to the, the my father's PX in Alameda, I'd buy comics there too. And one day I went in there and the first Marvel I ever really saw was Sergeant Fury number one. Mm. And it was sitting on the racks there and it just looked so different than any other war book I'd seen. So I picked it up and took it home and I read it. And I thought I did not care for Kirby's rendering style at all. but Every day, I kept pulling that thing out of the drawer and rereading it. And it wasn't until years later I realized that it was a combination of the dynamics and Kirby's storytelling. But you know, Stan's kind of you know bombastic uh, dialogue that really drew me in. And I saw house ads in there for all the other Marvel titles, so I started picking them up. And before long, I was just buying Marvel stuff. I I didn't buy any DC stuff for quite a while. I think until. Uh, Ditko went over there and started the creeper. I don't think I. Because um, you were I you were there. You were you would have been about twelve or so when Marvel was really kicking in with the Marvel yeah. Age of Comics, and I had read that Ditko's one of your uh, favorites of that period. Yeah, he uh, his work on Spider Man and Doctor Strange just blew me away. I just you know I was much more of a Ditko person than a Kirby person, although I liked them both and appreciated them both, but. Ditko, the you know the fact that he made Spider Man just like come to life with all these you know strange body language positions and actions and creating whole new worlds with Doctor Strange and I was just fascinated with uh, what he was able to do. Yeah, he's he's my favorite too. That those two Spider Man annuals what just give you everything you need to know in terms of body and but also the the dimensions and things with yeah. the Doctor Strange crossover. I I love that stuff. Yeah, more, than, more than Kirby. The annual the second annual is one of my all time favorite comics. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Mine as well. Yeah. But um <laughs> I just thought we'd get one thing out before I forget that, that when Starlin, because Starlin's got, as you can tell, major, you know, brownie points uh, in, it, in my mind, because in addition to after taking me up to Marvel and introducing me to Goodwin and others in this British region print department, when I got those assignments, I didn't find out until a couple of years later that that the only reason I got those British reprint assignments is that the editor took Starlin aside out of my earshot and said, I'll give this kid some work if you do a cover for me. Starlin did that, and he never told me. I had to find out from Milgram a few years ago. Oh, later. really? Wow. Yeah. Oh, wow. So, That's cool. Um, so he, he, was, he was looking out for you. Yeah, he's he, he's got you know major gold stars next to his name in my book. Oh, that's awesome. So how did you start work at Neil Adams Continuity Studios in, in 75? Did he remember you from the San Diego Comic-Con a couple years earlier? Uh, tell us about that. I ended up calling up Continuity soon after I arrived in New York and reminded whoever picked up the phone, who I assume was Pat Bastian, who was usually doing that at that time, and told him that you know Neil had told me two years before that if I worked real hard for 18 months, he'd be willing to look at my work again. So I was in town. I was wondering if I could come up and show my work again. And uh, mm-hmm. uh, she checked with Neil. She said, you know, come on by. And that's what I did. And I was very nervous. And this time I actually had continuity type samples in there, you know, sequential visual storytelling. Oh, cool. Uh, as, as opposed to pinups. I, I'd learned that lesson really well. And mm-hmm. um, they were just gearing up then to start packaging these large black and white magazine comics for Charlton that were based on TV shows, Six Million Dollar Man, Emergency in Space, 1999. Mm -hmm. And they were looking for some young guys to come in and pencil them under uh, Neil and Dick's, you know, tutelage. And then that way they could afford to package these things and and get them to Charlton. 
Mm. And so they asked me to, to be one of those people. And, and the, the only empty desk at that time was at the left hand of Neil. So I ended up working next to Neil for three years. Oh, cool. Uh, but it was very daunting and intimidating. There wasn't a lot of like hands-on lessons. It was more like I would take whatever I did originally and see how it evolved through all the, the process and what came out at the end and see what changes were made and figure out why. And that's how most of my lessons were learned up there. But Neil would have us all do these really tiny thumbnails. You'd take an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper, fold it into quarters, and then each quarter was a thumbnail for a full page. So it was very small. Mm. And then he'd look at them and with his flare pen, he would either strengthen the drawing or in some cases, he would just ignore what you'd drawn and draw something else without penciling it just with a flare pen. Mm. And then uh, he had one room in the back that had two large old autographs, which are Artographs, which are um, fancy opaque projectors that project straight down onto a desk, and you can adjust them for the size of the magnification and, and the focus. And we would take those tiny thumbnails, blow them up on the full size artboard, and trace off the basic shapes, and then take those and do the, the finished pencils from them. Oh, okay. And so then, those thumbnails kind of acted as a layout in a way. Yeah. And then with Neil approved the pencils, then they went to Dick. Giordano, who would farm either, he would often do a lot of the major you know, characters and faces and so on. And he'd on have the inking the, stage? Yeah. And occasionally, though, other people would come in, like, I have stuff that on those pages that Russ, he think that he was available to do some inking work, so they would have him do some of the major characters, too. Other people would come by, Vincente Alcazar would come by and visit once in a while, and he'd be inking. Mm-hmm. But uh, Nick, deal, Neil's uh, excuse me, Dick's assistants at the time were Bob Wyacek and Terry Austin. So mm-hmm. they were doing a lot of the backgrounds and background figures. And was was mm-hmm. Joseph Rubenstein there too at that point? Uh, I think he was just, uh, that was early in his stages there as like a high school intern or something like that. Right. That's, That's what right. it was. Yeah. 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 And, and then a little later on, Dennis Cowan was doing the same thing. He was there a lot. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then another guy named uh, Joe Desposito. I'm not sure if you're familiar with his work, but he's a, he's a very good painter. He was there. But so anyhow, by the time, you know, Neil, Dick, Russ, Terry, Bob got through with my pages, they looked fabulous. <laughs> at least right, the, right, 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 right. At least After uh, all the it, you know, whistles, based yeah. on what they, you know, they were originally given. So that's how I learned a lot uh, by looking at how that whole process worked. That's but kind of a into, cool, almost like a conveyor belt, but a very creative one. Yeah. And then, you know, at times just, you know, people would come to visit from out of town for a while, hang out in the studio. And if it looked like they were twiddling and thumbs too much, and Neil or Dick would say, hey, you want to do some of this or that? And you'd have other people, you know, ink in your stuff and you'd see neat, interesting takes on the final art of, based on what you'd given them. And uh, mm-hmm. it was a great way to see how different artists approach things and get you out of your default ruts on how you approach drawing or rendering things. Right. So tell the audience, what exactly is the Krusty Bunkers? That is a name for a a loose amalgam of creative talent that basically whoever happened to be at Continuity Studios when Continuity needed to get something inked quickly for a client. So mostly it was Dick Giordano and Neil Adams, but often Russ Heath, who was there too. Occasionally Jack Abel, who rented space up there. And then also renting space further back along the row were obviously Terry Austin and Bob Wycheck, but you had mm-hmm. Larry Hama and Ralph Reese. And oh, cool. there were other other people that would come and go all the time. You know, Alan Weiss ended up moving back to New York. So he was part of the Krusty Bunkers before he moved out of New York and then after he moved back. It just evolved constantly. It was evolved. There was a guy who did very little in the comics business, but was very, very talented named Ed Davis, who did a little bit of Krusty Bunkers work as well. Mm. So continuity kind of functioned as a as a shop, kind of like the the '40s shops, like the Iger and Eisner shop. And continuity was basically like that in the '70s. Is that correct? I guess in a way, although it was also kind of like a social crossroads. It was like the neutral ground between Marvel and DC, and places people could just come and hang out and shoot the breeze, or maybe right. even pick up a little bit of work. It was a very interesting atmosphere i mean there was a lot of strange personalities up there and people visiting a great sitcom could have been created out of that place (laughs) that would be fun so tell us about phasing out of continuity and entering marvel around what year was that 
Well, actually, it took a bit longer than that because I got into doing storyboards mostly for my living. That's something else mm -hmm. that Continuity uh, mm -hmm. uh, introduced me to. And I was able to make a lot more money drawing storyboards for oh, cool. than uh -huh. doing comics. I could pay, pay the same amount for drawing a single frame of a storyboard as they would for penciling a full page comics. And the, uh -huh. the storyboard had to, you know, could be very loose, whereas the comic stuff had to be very tight. So I ended up doing that most of the time. I, I ended up going on staff for a couple of years at a interpublic company at the time called Marshak that I think got absorbed by McCann Erickson at some point. But I always drew comics when I should have been sleeping and on weekends. Uh -huh. And including some stuff for DC, I worked with for Paul Levitz on adventure comics for a while. I did some Aqualad stuff and some Nightwing and Flamebird stuff. And then I created a new character called Cobalt and plotted and drew three episodes for that before the implosion killed that project. The DC said, implosion of 78, okay. Yeah, it never got uh, never got published. Uh, and then it was sort of a uh, spinoff of um, the Goodwin, Simonson, Manhunter universe, part of the DC universe. Oh, cool. Uh -huh. And then um, I would occasionally do bits and pieces of work for Marvel. And then Archie Goodwin at that point was overseeing Epic Illustrated magazine. And mm -hmm. I, I sold him a few short pieces and then I sold him my first real creator-owned creation called last of the dragons which mm -hmm. was uh, serialized initially in epic illustrated and that was with danny o'neill and that was 1982 uh yeah that's when it started and it ran through 83 yeah uh -huh. uh, okay. i think it was six installments um that one kind of spoiled me because i just came up with this idea started drawing it potted it out and i showed my drawings to terry austin at continuity and terry goes that looks great i'd, I'd be interested in thinking that at that mm -hmm. point, Terry had become like one of the hottest thinkers in the business. Mm -hmm. And so I take it up to Marvel and I show it to Archie Good and I say, um, Archie, I'm working on this thing. Here it is. Here's what it's about. Is this something you'd be interested in Epic Illustrated? He goes, yeah, I like that. It's great. Mm -hmm. And I say, well, I'm not really confident with my scripting yet. Is there any chance you'd want to script it? And he kind of smiled and he shook his head. No, I, you should find someone else to script it. So I walk outside and there's Denny O'Neill. I say, Denny, would you be interested in working on this and he looked at it and he goes yeah i like this do that so i needed a color so i walk in the bullpen there's marie severin i go hi marie check wow. this out is this something you'd be interested in she goes yeah that ran into jim novak i need a letter so i just thought that's the way things naturally happen everything <laughs> fell that easy it's like i got so spoiled that when things didn't happen like that in the future it was it was very frustrating hmm. uh, but one of the best compliments i ever got was from archie about Halfway through the series, I'd, I'd deliver each chapter up to him, and he was looking through uh, either chapter three or four when I delivered it, and he kind of shook his head, and he looked up at me and he says, you know, I should, I should have scripted this. He was sorry that he hadn't taken on the job, and I just felt extremely flattered to get that out of someone of Archie's stature. Wow. Can you talk about Archie a little bit? Because everybody does, and they all have sort of, I, I've yet to hear a bad story about him. But what it was, was your experience? It would be, it, it'd be very hard to find a bad story about Archie. <laughs> he was probably the most, when he was around, he was the most universally admired and liked professional in the comics business, I think. Everybody knew he was smart as a whip. He was extremely talented. He could write rings around most everybody. And he was a great editor, too. He'd have great insights. And he was also a very good visual storyteller. He would occasionally do layouts for the stories that, the artist would draw based on his work. It was kind of a bit of a cartoony style. I remember those cartoons he used to do on the inside sure. covers of the yeah the epic comics. But he was very good at visual storytelling as well. So yeah, and I think when those. he wrote his scripts, he always had the visual aspect in mind. That's what he was kind of known for, yeah. I think, right? Yeah, I think so. And I don't know if he did thumbnails for all of them, but he did for some of them. Mm -hmm. um, and I just, you know, he... You know, he was older than I was, and I kind of, you know, the next generation before me, and I kind of, you know, looked up to and revered him, like I think most people did. But he was like, you know, so easygoing and to be around. He wasn't pompous or stuck up at all. He was the exact opposite. He was very approachable. He was also a hell of a practical joker. He would often put his body at risk by doing these amazing pratfalls downstairs and all that on purpose to get a laugh out of people. Oh, really? Wow. And there was one time when some Marvel executives on the 11th floor were deciding that some people were coming in too late. And Archie never came in super early, but, you know, it's hard to think of anybody who worked harder than Archie. 
So I think it was supposed to be like you had to be in by 9.30 and the carrot was like if you came in by 9.30, there'd be bagels or something like this. But if you didn't, you know, you'd be in trouble or whatever. So everybody knowing that Archie often didn't come in till after 10 was like, you know, worried about, you know, what was going to happen. And so they set up the place where you had the bagels and all that, not not too far outside of Archie's office. And so we're all sitting there and eating bagels and all that and watching the clock. And a little bit after 10, the, uh, you know, Archie hasn't shown up yet and everybody's worried what's going to happen. And the door opens and Archie comes out in his pajamas and stretches. And uh, <laughs> everybody starts howling with laughter. He got in super early that day just to pull that joke off. Um, that's fun. So that's the kind of stuff he'd do. Yeah, uh, but so, just, a, just just a great guy. Yeah, that's great. So you worked on the Epic Illustrated and Last of the Dragons. How did that transition into joining Marvel's editorial staff in 1983? Well, one of the things that was happening simultaneously with getting some of this work was that there was a great amount of social interactivity in the comics professional field at that time in New York. Neil Adams would have these First Friday parties at his apartment where on the first Friday of every month, any professional could come over to his place for a party. And everybody got to know each other there from all the companies, including at that time, Archie Comics was still in in the area. And then during the warmer weather months, every Sunday in Central Park, there was an all day long comics industry volleyball game that was going on that you know, people from all over came in to play those things. I, I, we'd often play for 10 hours straight. It was great. And I got to know a lot of people there, including Jim Shooter, who was editor-in-chief at the time at Marvel. Mm-hmm. And um, it must have been a great volleyball player. I mean, just from the... Well, he was very intimidating. And <laughs> I, I think one of the things that might have been... Uh, I might be just projecting this, but one of the things that kind of impressed him was that, you know, most people, when he was jumping up in the front line to spike, they would like you know, try and dig an air raid shelter or something. Uh, they, don't know if they want to know part of that, but I'd go up there and try and block it. And uh, a few times when the, it was my turn to spike it and he was facing me, I'd go up like I was going to bash it and just slightly tap it. So it rolled down the other side of the net. So I, I think he thought that was pretty clever, but I couldn't pull that trick too many times. <laughs> right. That's but, great. But uh, he, um, he, uh, Al Milgram in, in early 83, Al Milgram was planning to leave the editorial staff and go freelance. And Shooter didn't feel any of the current crop of assistants were quite ready to promote. So he was asking around other professionals to see if they could recommend somebody to, to pull in from the outside. And he went out to dinner one night with Bill Sienkiewicz, who I'd been friends with for a couple of years. And I'd never even thought about being an editor before and certainly hadn't discussed anything like that with Bill, but Bill popped my name into the hat. And what little work Shooter had seen of mine, he'd been impressed with because he knew I liked, uh, you know, good, clear, compelling visual storytelling. I didn't, I didn't like confusing the reader. I liked enlightening the reader. Um, mm-hmm. And he also knew that, you know, if I was given solid feedback on something, that I was more than happy to to make the work better by changing it. Uh, I, I wasn't I wasn't a prima donna saying it's you know my way or the highway about everything. Right. And so I got a call from Shooter out of the blue, and I decided to to go for it. And I ended up beginning at the start, pretty much of 1983, being on the editorial staff. And Milgram fortunately stayed on for another week while I was there to help me get my feet under me. And I was also fortunate to inherit his assistant editor at the time, Ann Nascente, who um, knew how that office was running. So I basically took over all the titles Alan was doing at the time, with the exception of Marvel Fanfare, which he kept editing on a freelance basis out of my office. Mm -hmm. That's cool. So then you got along with Shooter, it sounds like, in the early 80s. Yeah, in the early 80s. Like before I got on staff, too. I mean, you know, whenever I met him in social, you know, settings and all that, we got along just fine. Mm -hmm. Um, And... When I got to Marvel, we generally got along pretty well. There was uh, one strange major incident where uh, we did not get along, but I managed to, uh, you know, kind of put that, lock that in the back closet somewhere and just forge forward uh, until things right. started getting more nuts in the in the, the latter part of his reign. But uh, I, uh, one of the things that kind of struck me was that I would occasionally be talking to some of the other editors and they'd you know, really have problems with Shooter. And mm-hmm. at that point, I'd had no problems with him. 
And I couldn't figure out why until a while later, I, I realized that those people who had started out at Marvel when Shooter was there that, you know, started out as interns and maybe became assistant editors and eventually became editors and so on. In his mind, he seemed to see them as whatever they came in on as that intern or assistant editor. Oh, and okay. it didn't matter how long they'd been there or how much they'd accomplished. She still saw them as this, you know, kind of clueless wonder that he had to, to mold and guide. Uh-huh. Whereas people that had had success outside of Marvel, like when he hired Milgram and Hama and Louise Simonson from, you know, other publishers or Denny and obviously Archie, they, he saw them more as peers. And he, since I'd been working at an ad agency uh, before he hired me, he, for some reason, he put me in that category of someone who had had success elsewhere. And therefore uh, he saw them more as a peer. And huh. if he had the same issue he needed to talk to about, with me or somebody else he'd hired from outside, he'd talk to them more like peer to peer, having a discussion about a point of contention. Whereas if it was with one of the people that had been raised in house, he was basically browbeating them. And wow. I, didn't, I didn't really realize that or find that out till later. So that's, that was a, uh, an interesting thing to discover about this guy's personality. That that's he, interesting. He treated yeah, that's really insightful. I had not heard that before. So basically, he would kind of go more Weisinger on them, in a way. I guess. I don't know. I mean, Weisinger sounds like, you know, he was shooter cubed, but uh, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. Uh, but, you know, Jim, Jim was a strange one. Uh, Neil Adams and Jim Shooter are both the most complex and perplexing personalities I encountered in the comics business. They've both been tremendous things that are, are great and good and generous. And they've both been things that are the exact opposite. Mm-hmm. And I, for the life of me, I can't figure out the, the rhyme or reason about what they do when. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And these are kind of like alpha male types who understand storytelling, but then come with a lot of polarizing things. Yeah. They're, they're very polarizing figures in a lot of ways, but there's also a lot of us that have seen both sides of them and mm-hmm. just can't figure out what tips the scales or which way they're going to react about something sometime. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure in their minds, they've got it all sorted out and everything makes perfect logical sense. But for the rest <laughs> of us, rest of us mere models, it can be confusing. Yeah. It's still confusing for us. Yeah. So, you know, going to your editing, you actually started out real strong. You edited uh, FF annual 17, Fantastic Four 258. These are John Byrne, Fantastic Four issues. How is editing John Byrne? Well, I didn't do a lot of actual editing on him because both of those, I think, had, had been started under Al's reign, and I just kind of took them over in the midst of production. Uh-huh. And I always got along just fine with John, but I could see that there was the potential for some issues down the road because I saw what he was turning in for the next batch of plots, and he liked just basically turning in one or two sentences for each issue. Uh-huh. And back then, what Marvel would do is they would pay a third of the writing rate for the plot and two thirds for when the final script came in, because almost everybody worked the Marvel method back then, which meant the artists worked from a plot and then the the finished pencils went to the writer to do the final script based on the Mm -hmm. pencil. Mm -hmm. So I was a little concerned that I felt that I I was going to have to talk to John about getting more out of, particularly since I think he has a brilliant story mind. But occasionally, Mm -hmm. some of the stories, the endings felt unsatisfying. They had these deus ex machina things. If I remember right, I might not be remembering right, but that that FF annual, it's like it had to do with the the Cree and Cree milk from Cree cattle or, uh, you know, (laughs) some strange, interesting thing. But uh, And in the end, it all got fixed because Reed came up with some spray and sprayed everything. And I just felt that was so um, disappointing. So I felt yeah, that a lot it, of his endings are, are kind of like that, actually. That's interesting. <laughs> well, I, I never, the impression I never I got, thought about that. The impression I got was that he comes up with these really interesting concepts and figures, you know, he's going to write them and, and then, you know, they'll kind of write themselves and they'll come up to an ending. And sometimes that works for some people and sometimes it doesn't. You end up with sort of a, you know, things kind of fizzle out or you have to come up some day sex smack and a thing to, to try and pull it all together. And, you know, Sometimes he was just so spot on. This this stuff was brilliant. And other times it kind of fell flat at the end. And I I, I wanted to try and keep that more consistent. So I was uh, gearing up to try and talk to him about writing more substantial plots uh, that had the ending figured out before he started diving into them. 
And I knew that that there was a good chance that was not going to go over well, and we were going to end up uh, having disagreements on that. But then Shooter said that he was up for you know expanding the line and trying new things, and I'd had a whole bunch of stuff that um, I'd been thinking about doing. And another new, relatively new editor up there, Bob Benyansky, needed some titles to fill out his roster, so I kind of gave up the FF and the thing that little FF franchise um, uh, to Bob in order to get space to do my, the new projects I wanted to do. Also, Louis Simonson had pitched Power Pack to me and right. I wanted to edit that as well. But I had ideas for um, Alien Legion, Shadow Masters, Amazing High Adventure and, and some other things, Spellbound. And also initially I was going to think I was going to edit Longshot and the Cynthia had come up with the basic concept for that and I teamed her up with Art Adams, so I discovered my first day on the job in the in the pile of unanswered submissions. Right. Uh, yeah, you you discovered a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was one of the, the big pluses of that job was discovering and mentoring a lot of the talent that went on to have uh, great careers, and it's very gratifying. So but, you, um, you also edited Defenders, Hulk, mm-hmm. Doctor Strange, Alpha Flight, Moon Knight, and you even inked every now and then. I saw you inked Moon Knight at some point, too. So, yeah, that was what, that was before I was editing. Though, when you were editing, you technically weren't supposed to do any of the creative work unless it was part of you know your editorial duties. So, as you couldn't really freelance the work that you were editing. It, it was that was the way we kept things balanced properly. Mm-hmm, I see. So that inking of Moonlight was before officially yeah. being an editor. Yeah, that was being that was when Denny I think was editing the title. Okay, uh, I gotcha. I got to ink some uh, Kevin Nolan pencils there and i learned a lot doing that jeez that's boy he's exciting. great yeah in fact when i started editing i don't know if you uh, noticed but um kevin ended up doing a lot of my covers i'd often do these for my covers i'd do these quick layouts and give them to the artist to do the finished work and if you ever looked at kevin's old blog site he's got a few of the the, the scribbles i sent him and he showed oh, cool. the stages of what he uh, he turned them out into so it was great seeing me send off these scribbles and have these amazing pieces <laughs> of work come back in. And it was, he at one point too, he told me that he decided he wanted to not draw anymore. He just wanted to letter. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I told him he was nuts, but that I, as long as he was being nuts, I'd give him as much lettering as I could. So he ended up redesigning uh, and redesigning a number of my logos. He designed oh, cool. the, the original Punisher miniseries logo, mm-hmm. Rocket Raccoon, Solomon Kane. Mm-hmm. When we did, oh, the, when we relaunched Doctor Strange and before mm-hmm. that, the Strange Tales one. But so he did, I, I tried to keep him as busy as I could no matter what. But then thankfully, he saw the light of day and started drawing again. Started drawing again. Yeah. Sometimes people need a break from certain things. So then you edited the Rocket, the first Rocket Raccoon miniseries. How do you feel Rocket Raccoon turned out in the Guardians of the Galaxy movies? Pretty well. I, I tell people kind of only half jokingly that it took 30 years to be vindicated for, you know, <laughs> watching that first miniseries because <laughs> for being involved uh, I, in the first I, one yeah yeah when i proposed it a lot of the other editors just laugh they say what that's not gonna work mm-hmm. uh, and that was also mike mignola's first series yeah. as a penciler and up to that point yeah, i think he penciled uh one or two short jobs for milgram and fanfare mm-hmm. uh, uh submariner stuff and he'd send in when he was sending in his inks He'd often have these neat little drawings he'd do on the backs of the pages of, you know, weird little characters and monsters and, and stuff. And Bill Mantlow and I would look at these things and just think, you know, this stuff's great. I wish there was a, an outlet for this kind of stuff here. And Mantlow proposed doing a, a Rocket Raccoon miniseries. Mantlow was one of the, the co-creators of that property. And so we asked Mike to, to pencil it. So that was his first uh, Marvel series as a penciler. And mm-hmm. after that, since he didn't really care to draw humans, superheroes that much, I needed a new artist on the Hulk. So I put him on the Hulk and he was there for quite a while. Oh, wow. So then as far as Mike Mignola being one of the people that you discovered and mentored, as well as Arthur Adams, also Wills Protasio, Jim Lee, John Bogdanovi, quite a lot of names. So Larry Stroman. Larry Stroman. Yeah. Steve Scrooge, Sal Valuto, June Brigman, right? These are all people. Yeah, though so there's a few of them there where I didn't technically discover them. Like uh, June, we, I, Weezy introduced me to June's work, and I just thought I see. it was amazing. And then um, 
Mike had been doing inking and he penciled one or two jobs for Milgram. So I can't really take credit for, for that, but I did pretty much, uh, I think mentor him when he came on board as a full-time penciler. Oh, how cool. And then at the same time, working with people like Bill Sienkiewicz and like you already mentioned, Terry Austin. So there's just a lot of creativity going on in the middle 80s. At the time, did it feel like all these names were going to be big at some point? You know, it's strange. When you're in the midst of it, it's like the norm. And Mm -hmm. part of you realizes, you know, this is fabulous. This is great. You know, I get to make my living, you know, doing all this stuff and with all these great people and having a blast. And there's a part of you that, you know, that's just the everyday norm. So it isn't until it goes away that it really hits you what a you know an amazing period of time that was. Um, I'd say during my 13 years on staff at Marvel from 83 to 96, at least uh, 10 of those 13 years were the best professional work experience on staff I've ever had anywhere. The last year and a half of Shooter's Reign was a nightmare. And then my last year and a half or so there when the Ron Perlman people had taken over Marvel and were busy driving it into bankruptcy twice. That was a huge nightmare. Right. But the rest of that time, it was great. Uh, all of us up there loved what we were doing. Most of us got along really well, and in fact, so well that we were often doing social things together uh, out of the office. And we, you know, we generally, you know, were rooting for each other, trying to help each other out. There wasn't like a lot of the inter-office and fighting that there seemed to be occasionally at DC with some of the older editors up there, although a little of that ended up coming to Marvel eventually. You got to work with Deadco too, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, well... Talk about that for a minute. Oh, I first met Steve, believe it or not, despite his reputation, I first met Steve at a party. During those Neil Adams First Friday parties, he at some point, I think in 1976, managed to talk Deadco into coming to one of them. And so I walk in and there's Ditko sitting on the sofa by himself and everybody else seems to be too scared to go up and talk to the guy. And Starlin happened to be there and Starlin had known Ditko for a long time when, when Jim was a fan and would come to New York. He's one of those guys that would call up Ditko and Ditko would have him over and they'd, they'd talk and shoot the breeze. Oh, really? So, yeah. That's so, cool. so Starlin, Starlin's one of those guys, if you, you can see it in his work, he's like the perfect amalgam between Kirby and Ditko. Yeah. He's like he's like the love child of Kirby and Ditko. Yeah, that, that doesn't <laughs> make sense. Yeah. So he takes me over there and 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 he says, "Steve, this is Carl. He thinks you're God." And then he Starlin walks away, and so I'm sitting there going, oh, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, yeah." You know, I don't know what the hell to say after that, and because a that's embarrassing on its own, but b if you know anything about Ditko's and Randy and objectivist uh, look at. You know, he thinks all religion is bunk and opiate for the masses. So to be compared to a god is like a double <laughs> insult. Um, right. So I managed to, you know, to talk a bit to him and get to, to know him a little bit. But he didn't last long at that party. He, did, he didn't last long. He was, he was gone before too long. But I would occasionally run into him here and there. And then when I was on staff at Marvel for a while, Ditko came back to work at Marvel. And the conditions were that he would not work on any of the characters he was more closely associated with basically Spider-Man and Doctor Strange from his initial run at Marvel. Mm-hmm. And that he uh, also had gotten more entrenched in his view that heroes should be heroes and shouldn't have any real faults, right. uh, which, is, which of course is at the core of Marvel's whole success was fallible heroes. So one time uh, when I was editing, uh, one of the magazines I launched was uh, a self-parody book that was sort of reincarnation of uh, Not Brandeck called What the... Yeah, And I asked Steve, you know, I know you like doing, you know, humor work sometimes. Would you like to do a piece for our, our self-parody magazine? And he goes, yes, but only if it just parodies villains. I don't parody heroes. So <laughs> I, I talked to, to Mark Grunewald about this and Mark said, I'll write something. I'll write something. So yeah. he, he wrote basically a parody of kind of sort of Secret Wars. And I think he was so worried about getting backlash from Shooter about parodying Secret Wars that he used the pseudonym Gwyn Dibley, which if you know your Monty Python history, that was one of the names Monty <laughs> Python considered using before they settled on Monty Python was Gwyn mm. Dibley. So then I got, Ditko did it, and I got Severin Inc., and it was great. Oh, that's but, awesome. Uh, and then we did a few other things here and there, but I, I also, when I became executive editor, uh, one of the things I ever saw was a relaunch of uh, Phantom, as Phantom 2040 or something like that, right. 2020. Uh-huh. And Ditko was doing the layouts, and I always liked the the inkers over Ditko who could 
retain Ditko while also making it more contemporary. Mm-hmm. And I, one of the best of those was Craig Russell, Craig on Ron. Yeah, I, just, absolutely. Yeah. And, and in a totally different way, in a different direction, I thought uh, Reinhold, Bill Reinhold would be perfect. And he did a fabulous job over Ditko on, on Phantom 2040. Again, keeping Ditko while totally updating and modernizing him in a very different way than Craig Russell did. I always wanted to, I'd, I'd considered at one point, and I never got around to it, seeing what Kevin Nolan would do over Ditko. He did it. He, yeah, he did I, it. there was a short DC thing, right? Yeah, the, the uh, Spectre issue, uh, or a Spectre short story yeah. that he did. It was interesting. It was it was really kind of heavy. I mean, there, you, but you'd still get a little bit of Ditko from it. But it was yeah. it was beautiful looking. Yeah, that was the one thing I'd be worried about because Kevin t- seems to overwhelm almost anybody he inks. But um, there was actually a project we never got off the ground at Marvel that I, I'm not sure if Fabian Nicieza came up with the idea or if he was going to write it. But it was basically in that, that second Spider-Man annual, the, the wedding of Reed and Sue, you see glimpses of battles between various you know superheroes and villains all over New York, but you never really got to look in to see what each of those things was about. So mm-hmm. the idea of the series would be uh, each issue would concentrate on one of those battles and what went on and they would each be penciled by a then living member of marvel's uh, silver age bullpen and inked by a more contemporary inker so at that time still alive were the bisema brothers ditko kirby was gone by then unfortunately but don heck was still around i think you know there were some others that were you know more loosely associated i think like george tuska and so on but the idea was to match them up we each with a contemporary anchor. And for Ditko, I was, I was playing with the idea of either Scott Williams or Kevin Nolan. But uh, unfortunately, we never pulled that one off. Now did, it's you ever see, did you ever see Steve Laola's inks on Ditko? He did it. It was the backup for uh, in uh, Eclipse's uh, Coyote. Oh, did, yeah, Dijin? Something like yeah, that. The yeah, that was it. Yeah, those, yeah, those Steve, were nice. Steve's enough. Steve's another one who, you know, has great admiration for Ditko and, you know, will always try and, you know, keep the flavor. Yeah. Yeah. He's he's very good. Both Steve's are very good on that case, yeah. So now we hit about 1987 in our timeline, and you said that the last year and a half or so, Undershooter used the phrase nightmare. So basically, it sounds like in the early 80s, there was a positive relationship, but then what, something flipped or changed toward the end? What happened there? Well, that's something that a lot of us that lived through that era have never been able to quite figure out what flipped the switch in Jim's mind because he used to brag about how he'd assembled the greatest roster of editors in the history of comics. And then at some point within a short amount of time, he went on with this attitude that we were all a bunch of clueless idiots that needed to be led by the hand by him, the master. Mm -hmm. And that caused just you know, all kinds of consternation. And a lot of it was aggravated by the two Secret Wars series. And then New Universe came along and he decided he was going to you know, be in charge of every aspect of that. And that turned into a huge nightmare. Um, I see. So was failure of the New Universe part of this change? I think so. But it really started with the Secret Wars thing because... Jim decided this was like such a big, important thing that only one person could possibly edit it or mm-hmm. write it and then essentially edit it. And that was him. Mm-hmm. And the policy that he'd had in place up until that time was that, as I mentioned earlier, that he encouraged editors to do freelance creative work. He felt it was good to keep them experienced on both sides of the desk. so they didn't just, just not on their own titles. Right. So, or you couldn't write or do any of the art on a book that you edited, you also couldn't write or do the art on a book edited by someone you supervised. So like when I Mm -hmm. became executive editor, I oversaw a third of the editorial department and I could not do creative work for any of those people because I was in charge of their reviews. I oversaw them. I had higher capacity over them, except uh, the only person that was immune to Shooter's rule was Shooter. Mm -hmm. And so when he was writing as editor in chief, Ideally, what would have happened if he was, you know, following his own rules, the publisher, Mike Hobson, would have been the editor on those. But, you know, when one of the line editors had to edit Secret Wars or any of the New Universe titles um, like that, he could and he did often override them. He would totally blow deadlines left and right. 
and cause total chaos in that regard. He could, you know, commandeer the whole bullpen to concentrate on getting out the late books that he'd caused to be late and therefore causing everybody else that was working on books that were on time to be penalized because their books suddenly became late because the bullpen was all tied up. And he would get into headbutting sessions occasionally with people, and then he'd just fire them. He hired and fired Denny. He promoted and then fired Carlin. And there were other people that left before they got fired. They knew they were going to be fired. Mm -hmm. Uh, Just that he went from someone who just would occasionally get into this weird, obstinate mood to someone who that was the standard operating procedure. And I I do not understand exactly why or how that happened. There's been a few theories, but I've never really known why it was that that's one question i've always wanted to to find out is like how he changed his mind from having assembled the greatest editorial staff in comics history to how he assembled a bunch of clueless idiots and if so what does that say about the person that hired them and trained them <laughs> you know so that kind of logic doesn't seem to have filtered down when you say secret wars you mean because there was such a corporate financial success so that may have increased the ego is that Kind of well, it, it was more, I think it was more along the lines that he insisted that every title in the Marvel Universe do some sort of crossover with Secret Wars. And so, and all of those crossovers had to be coordinated and approved by him. Okay. And since he was so hands on with this thing, very few people ever pleased him with what they were doing. Oh, okay. And he, they would keep being revised, revised, revised. As a, an example, on the Hulk, since he was also so late, I mean, Secret Wars was very, very late because the writer started out very late and the writer was Shooter. And mm-hmm. the editor couldn't really threaten to fire Shooter because Shooter was his boss. Mm-hmm. It just it made, it made no sense. So I liked having all my books done as close to the ideal schedule as possible. I liked having about five different issues in various stages of production at the same time. The mm-hmm. one that was about to go out the door, you know, was having the final production work done on it. The issue before that was being colored. The issue before that was being inked. The one before that was being penciled. The one before that was being scripted, et cetera. And that way, if somebody ever did have a problem, you know, they got hurt or injured or, you know, family issues or whatever, I could often, you know, have some wiggle room to keep the creative crew and the, and the continuity of the book going. But if you start out late, there's no wiggle room. and so I had a couple issues of the Hulk that were already passed where the Secret Wars crossover was going to be when Jim finally got around to saying, you got to do a Secret Wars crossover. So we had to kind of carve out a Secret Wars crossover out of a book that was already been done. And we did that. And Manuela was penciling the Hulk for me at the time. Mm-hmm. And of course, Shooter had to approve those. And I got the Xeroxes back from Shooter of, of Mike's stuff that had these incredibly harsh, insulting notes all over. He hated Mignola's work. Oh. And I told my assistant, all right, we're going to have to make some changes here. Do not send Mike copies of the <laughs> Shooter's notes on them. Send him the blank ones, and then I'll send my notes on what to change. Mm-hmm. And the assistant accidentally put the wrong oh. ones in, and... Whenever I run into Mike now, we still often converse about his reaction when he opened those pages up and saw Shooter's comments. It was not pleasant. Oh, but, gosh. Um, it was just like, you know, the dark side. He got won over by the dark side. There you go. The dark side and, seduced his and soul. Often when someone goes over to that side, they're convinced that they are the only ones that knows what they're doing. They're the only ones right, and the rest of the world go to hell. And that's sort mm-hmm. of the attitude that was coming out of that office. I got gotcha. you. Um, like, and that's basically what the Corvax saga was all about. Maybe. I don't think I've read any of that or recall it anyway. 1987, then when New World Cinema buys Marvel from the Cadence people and Jim Galton is still working there and that transition occurred, Jim Shooter was let go throughout this transition and Tom DeFalco becomes the new editor-in-chief. As far as the creative people feeling at this point burnt out with Shooter's role as editor, are you aware of any other reasons of why he was let go at that time? Oh, boy, oh, boy. There's all kinds of stuff that was happening around there. It's hard for me to remember Pinpoint. exactly yeah, what was going on. But, you know, there had been, I'm sure there had been people, you know, major creative forces that had had problems with Shooter that had decided, well, if I'm going to be screwed out of Marvel anyway, I'm going to go talk to the publisher. 
And right. that was Mike Hodson. That's a name a lot of people don't in the comics fandom aren't aware of, but Mike Hodson was very important in Marvel's success during the 80s. And I think that Jim Galton was aware of this too. Both of those, by the way, are Galton and Hobson are both amongst my favorite executives that I worked for at any given time. And when they got pretty much chased out of Marvel and replaced by Ron Perlman's people, it was like night and day. But this will give you an example of Jim Galton, his managerial style. At one point when DeFalco was editor-in-chief, Galton wanted to ask Tom some stuff. And, you know, most presidents of the company would stay on the 11th floor and call for the editor-in-chief on the 10th floor to come up and see them. But Galton went for a walk downstairs and stuck his head into Tom's office and saw that Tom was sitting there with his back to the door, his feet up on the desk, thinking about something. So Galton turns around and walks back to his office. But Tom's secretary had seen him. Later on, Galton comes back down later in that day and looks in and sees that Tom's busy with some bureaucratic paperwork. And he goes in and talks to him and asks him whatever it was he wanted to ask him about. And Tom says to Galton, you know, my assistant told me you'd come down here before. Why didn't you ask me whatever you wanted to ask me then? And Galton says, I pay you to think strategically about the future. I came down here and saw you doing that, so I didn't want to interrupt you. I mean, that's mm. the kind of, wow, that's that's kind great. of person that we had running the company back then. So you like them. You like Jim. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. And then Hobson was in a similar mold. Hobson had come from a publishing background, and he saw more closely, I think, than even Galton, because he was a bit closer to a lot of the creative people, you know, what was happening with Shooter. There was this thing that happened about a month or so before Shooter was let go that ended up being kind of called the Palace Revolt or, you know, Storming the Bastille, where a bunch of us went in to really kind of have it out with Shooter in Mm -hmm. his office. And in the middle of that, someone decided that Hobson should witness this. So they came down, they brought him down, and he saw what was going on in Shooter's office when we were, uh, you know, going back and forth about how he was handling the company and the personnel. And I think that made an impression on him, too, that he basically lost the confidence of uh, the rank and file of all the editorial staff or most of I it. I see. And there were, you know, Shooter kept trying to do various things, and that was very annoying to the powers that be. And they finally, you know, they were reluctant to get rid of him because they'd had a lot of success with him at the helm for quite some time. And mm-hmm. for all of the grief that he caused with the uh, Secret Wars, it had been, a, you know, a huge financial success. And got a lot of media coverage and everything else. So I think they were trying to be as patient as they could with all the other aspects. But at some point, it just, it wasn't worth it. I got you. How do you like work with Tom DeFalco as editor-in-chief? Tom's the best boss I ever had. He's one of those people that I, as a management style that I like to have, which was that if there was a disagreement about something, I could go into Tom and I could lay out my argument as logically and as passionately as I could. And I'd have a honest a chance as possible at convincing of my point of view. And if I did, that was great. But if Tom decided he needed to go in another direction, I knew it wasn't out of selfishness or maliciousness or anything like that. That's what he honestly felt needed to be done. Mm -hmm. And he knew that even though I didn't feel that way, that I would execute it to the best of my ability. I would not half-ass it or, you know, try and ignore it or anything like that. I would try and execute to the best of my ability. Mm -hmm. And that to me is how professionals work. And so, and that's the way pretty much the whole staff, not everybody, pretty much the whole staff was like that. Yeah, one person we haven't really talked much about in the midst of all this who was supremely important was Mark Grunewald. Yeah, Mark Grunewald, exactly. So Mark, to me, was like sort of the personification of the heart and soul of Marvel's creative mood and personality. I mean, he started there in the late 70s, but until his death. And he breathed and loved comics, particularly Marvel comics, but comics of all kinds. Yeah. and he was one of those people that he could not wait till Monday morning to, to go in and make more comics. And he was also you know, the one that pretty much, you know, organized all the office parties for Halloween and Christmas and so on. Or if there were, you know, birthday events in the office, things like that, he'd have all these kind of contests and, you know, things going on. He created the Marvel Olympics set for the conventions where He'd have the Marvel editorial and creative staff that were at the conventions engage in contests with the fans so the fans could win, you know, Marvel prizes, whether they were comics or collections or posters or whatever. And a lot of us in the comics business are pretty much introverts by nature. Mm -hmm. And 
in a weird way, Mark was too, but he'd forced himself to be an extrovert by force of will. <laughs> and he was so enthusiastic about doing these contests with the fans at the conventions that the rest of us wouldn't want to let him down. And so he could corral us to do things we would never do on our own. You know, even when DeFalco was vice president and editor in chief of Marvel, he could get Tom DeFalco on the stage in these contests to bust balloons with your butts with the fans, see how many could bust these, these <laughs> balloons, you know, within a certain amount of time. This is the friggin' VP and editor in chief of Marvel busting balloons on the stage with the fans. And, you know, <laughs> and Grunewald can make it happen. Yeah. Yeah, oh, and great. you know that I don't know if you're that old uh, Fametti book where we're all in the pyramid, the human pyramid. That's all Mark's stuff. That's all his idea. You should have been at his wedding. Oh my God! Everybody got a whoopee cushion. So like when the toast comes around, everybody's on the <laughs> toast. Everybody's got to sit on the whoopee cushions, and and they were all customized. Each one was customized by Mark, and just you know everything was like a celebration and and a fun thing, a fun event to do with him. It was so sad that when he passed away, it really was an end of an era in a lot of ways because that was right when the worst of the worst was starting to happen with the, the bankruptcy. Ron, yeah, the Ron Perlman stuff. And they basically turned someone who couldn't wait to get in on Monday morning to go to work making Marvel comics to someone who on Friday couldn't wait to get the hell out of Dodge and drive upstate to his weekend house so he can get the hell away out of everything. And to me, it's no accident that his heart attack happened early on a Monday morning, right before he was going to have to get up and drive back in and deal with all oh, the man. in the office. Oh, boy. So did he, and I guess one more question about Grunewald before we go on to your Punisher War Journal in 88, is did he express about working with Shooter and Tom DeFalco and working with those editor-in-chiefs? Did he uh, enjoy working with them? Well, he and Tom got along great. They were like peas in a pod. And they also were constantly playing practical jokes on each other that neither one would ever admit to. Like one would do one to the other, and then the other one would have to get them back. And they never spoke about it. It was hilarious. Mm. But Shooter, he had lots of problems with Shooter. In fact, that meeting where we stormed the Bastille, basically when we went into Shooter's office, he was in the midst of a meeting with Ralph Macchio and Grunewald and browbeating them about something, and they weren't happy. And then they're caught in the middle between this crowd of rebellious editors and Shooter and you could see as the meeting went on and on that they're sinking lower and lower in the chairs, oh. <laughs> trying to get out of the line of fire. But, you know, I think like everybody else, he saw all the good things about Shooter and all the bad things. Well, he was pretty fair and even killed person. So tell us about overseeing the development of the Punisher. Basically, you're credited as turning the Punisher from a side character to someone that could star in his own series. You did the layouts and the writing for the first Punisher War Journal issues in 1988 with Jim Lee doing the finish art. Tell us about that as a mission and what exactly happened there. Initially, I can't remember if the first Punisher project I was started editing was a five-issue miniseries by Grant and Zek, or there was a very long project, which was the first Punisher graphic novel called Assassin's Guild that Joe Duffy wrote and Jorge Zavino did the art on. I know they were in production simultaneously, but I can't remember which was the first one I started working on. But in any case, I remember Grant and Zach proposed the miniseries to me. And I, at that point, I hadn't really seen anything from Grant's work that particularly impressed me, but I really liked his take on the, the Punisher for the miniseries. And I'd always loved Zach's work. So that's another project that I championed in the approval process. And a lot of the other editors thought I was nuts because, you know, this guy had no superpowers. He was, you know, as much a villain as a hero and, you know, only been a second string guest star and he used real world weaponry. And, you know, how on earth is anybody going to buy this thing? But I like their take on it. And I also saw at the time in other popular media that films like the Clint Eastwood Dirty Harry films and the Charles Bronson Death Wish film, things like that were, you know, seeming to gaining in popularity. So mm -hmm. I thought there might be something in the air. So I took a chance on that, and it turned out to be a big hit. One of the things I don't think people, another Archie Goodman-related thing, I don't think people give Archie enough credit for is the sort of incarnation of the, the Punisher that became popular. You know, in the early stages when he was like in Spider-Man and so on like that, he was, you know, much different character, not anywhere near as, you know, serious or realistic, so to speak, as the version that became popular. 
And a lot of people forget that Archie Goodman wrote two stories that appeared in different black and white magazines featuring the character. And I think that kind of reestablished the character with a new kind of frame of reference and seriousness. And that is what I believe is what gave Frank Miller his take on the character. And I believe that that's guest starred in Daredevil. And I believe that is what inspired Grant and Joe Duffy. Joe Duffy was Archie's assistant at the time. And that's also what inspired me when I started writing my stuff. So I think a lot of it goes back to Archie Goodwin's take on the character, which a lot of people have forgotten, unfortunately. I remember um, those magazine covers where the Punisher was featured, and it was so different from the Ross Andrew yeah. Spider-Man version. Yeah. If I remember, I think one of them was a Gray Morrow painting. I yeah, remember. it was. Yeah. Boy, how in the hell do I remember that? Jeez. Did you choose Jim Lee to do the art on that? How did that work? Well, on the ongoing, when the miniseries was over and it proved to be a hit, and I decided to do an ongoing series, had Mike Barron do the writing, and Klaus Janssen came on board to do all of the art, including the coloring, he did penciling and coloring. And Klaus, a lot of people don't give him credit for his coloring, but he knew how to color, and he knew how to color for that god-awful paper we had at the time. And so he had a really distinctive look to that. But that kept going, and I kept coming up with these ideas for Punisher stories, but there was no place to put them because Mike didn't need me, Baron didn't need me to generate ideas for him. He had a ton of his own. And the, the book just took off, so I'm thinking, I'm wondering if this character can you know, support another title. And I thought, well, if we did it, the Punisher War Journal, where in that book, we went more into the internal workings of the character, a bit more in his thoughts and his war journal entries, because Mike's take on the character was pretty much external. You hardly ever got into his interior thoughts. Like even when Microchip's son died, he didn't go into his thoughts. It was just the external actions there. So I proposed that, and editorial and the sales department thought that was a great idea. But since I was on staff at Marvel, I didn't have time to both write and do layouts for it unless it went on a six-week schedule. So that's why it started out on a six-week schedule. And I was looking for someone to do the finished start over it and uh, thought about a couple of people, but had not even considered Jim Lee, who at that time was drawing Alpha Flight for me, which was his first series. And I was talking to Jim on the phone one day when we were talking about Alpha Flight, and then we were just shooting the breeze after that. And I told him how I was looking for somebody for this thing, and he volunteered. And I thought, well, I'm no idiot. <laughs> But it was kind of like, you know, uh, robbing from myself because he was doing, he was like growing in leaps and bounds on Alpha Flight. But so I ended up finding someone else for Alpha Flight and Jim uh, ended up doing the finished artwork over my layouts on Word Journal. I ended up, I think, doing, laying out five of the first seven issues. But after that, it got, it was just so popular that the sales department was screaming for it to go monthly. And Jim, obviously, Jim didn't need anybody doing layouts for him. So I just bit the bullet and said, okay, I'll just stick to the writing. And that's where it went from there. The character got so popular, everybody wanted to guest star him. And that's when things kind of got nuts. Kind of chaotic as far as the character. Yeah, because in 1988, I was 10. So there were three things. My first comic experiences were Tom DeFalco and Ron Friends Thor. And then uh, uh, it was that's a also good experience. <laughs> that was a good experience for me. And then yeah. also the trade paperback of the Dark Knight Returns that had come out, and then also the trade paperback reprint, and then then Punisher War Journal from the first issue, or yeah, from the first issue all the way through the Wolverine Punisher crossovers. So that was like kind of like my entry into comics. So then. Now, just kind of moving along to the next year, 1989, and the Perlman Revlon people take over Marvel from New World Cinema, and you became executive editor of the Epic Imprint and also one-third of the Marvel title. So what does an executive editor do? Well, what happens when after Tom was editor-in-chief, he made Mark Grunewald his executive editor, and then as the line and everything kept growing, there was a lot of books for just those two people to look after. And when Archie Goodwin decided to leave Marvel and go back to DC, and there was a great danger that the executives were going to just fold up the Epic line because a lot of them up there had this attitude, well, we don't even own this stuff and it doesn't sell as well as the other, you know, the Marvel owned stuff anyway. Why are we even publishing this stuff? 
and a lot of us felt it was very important for Marvel to create our own stuff and to be more diverse than things that were just in the Marvel universe. So Tom decided that someone had to try and fill Archie's shoes, and it was a thankless task because nobody can fill Archie's shoes. It's like I said, it's trying to fill the shoes of the most universally respected and liked person in the business. But I did not want to see Epic shut down. So when Tom asked me to come in and oversee that, I, I agreed to it. And then eventually they added Bob Budiansky as another executive editor, and we ended up just divvying up everything Marvel was publishing into thirds. And so I had a good chunk of the Marvel line as well as the Epic stuff, and they each also had a third of the Marvel line. And basically what each executive editor does is they oversee different groups of editors that each editor, in theory, had about five monthly books and then a handful of special projects and many series and graphic novels and so on. And our job was to make sure that the work was being done on time and being done well. And mm -hmm. if there were issues to deal with them or if there were personnel issues to deal with those with the editorial staff or occasionally with their freelancers, if there were issues that couldn't be resolved amongst the editor and the freelancer. Right, uh, oh, I see. And then, so it kind of removed us a bit from the hands-on editing, which was a drag and made us a bit more, you know, executive level type activity and so on, which I like wearing a lot of hats, so I don't mind doing that stuff. I just didn't like the fact that the ratio of the creative work went way down based on that, but it was important work. So we would also be involved with the training of the newer editors. Uh, after Tom was made editor-in-chief, he and Mark Grunewald devised a curriculum for the Marvel Assistant Editors Training Program. So for at least an hour or once a week, usually Mark would run the training sessions for the assistant editors, and Tom would occasionally do some stuff, and then I would come in and do things, particularly when it came to visual storytelling. But it was mostly Mark and Tom doing that. And the, the concept there was that each assistant editor was assigned to a specific editor, and that was basically who they learned from. And mm -hmm. since all editors have their strengths and weaknesses, the assistant editors, therefore, are not getting a well-rounded education. You might have someone who's a great story person but doesn't draw or know how to draw well, doesn't know a lot about drawing or doesn't know visual storytelling well. Or they might be great on the creative stuff, but the administrative stuff is a nightmare in their office. So they devised this you know, comprehensive training system. So after you'd gone through the system in a year, this this training program, you had a much more well-rounded education on what would make an ideal editor in theory than, you know, if you just were mentored by one single person. That was a great thing because we kept having to expand the staff. Even with that, the staff got expanded. People got promoted before they were ready. And, and occasionally a few of them did not do well, but most of them did as well as they did, I think, in large part to that training program that Mark and Tom came up with. Oh, that's cool. So then in 94 through 96, going toward the Marvel bankruptcy and you leaving Marvel, you became editor-in-chief of Epic in 1994, and then Marvel goes bankrupt in 1996, and then you leave. Give us those circumstances and the circumstances of the bankruptcy and the Perlman guys, and then why you left. Well, at some point, I think it was in 94, that they pretty much forced out Tom DeFalco as being editor-in-chief. and. There was a guy that the Perlman people had brought in who was a huge comics fan, Terry Stewart, that was president of Marvel, and he's supposed to run Marvel. And you know, Whereas people like DeFalco and Hobson were amongst my favorite people to work for, that my people I reported directly to, I, I cannot say that at all about Terry Stewart. He was a, a big fan of comics, so I'll give him that. Loved Marvel, but he was a horrible executive. Uh -huh. And so he came up with this idea that each major group of Marvel titles would have its own editor-in-chief. So the five editor-in-chiefs were Grunewald, Budiansky, Bob Harris, Bobby Chase, and myself. And I had the most eclectic line. I had everything from what was left of Epic at the time because the Perlman people did not want to have anything to do with Epic. And the alternate universe type stuff like what was left of What If and the Alterniverse, things like uh, Ruins and The Last Avengers Story, and then all the licensed stuff, everything from you know Barbie to Conan and the Clive Barker stuff, and the occasional odds and ends here and there. But the idea in theory was that this is like their kind of corporate thinking was that each 
editor in chief would be like their own miniature publishing house. They'd have their own dedicated marketing plan and budget and their, their own editorial budget and so on. And, you know, it'd be like this internal competition kind of thing that would make, keep things feisty and moving and typical corporate kind of buzzword thinking, which did not work at Marvel. It basically negated one of the best things about Marvel, whereas we were all in it together. We all pulled for each other. We all tried to help each other out instead of competing for limited resources. And one of the things that, even though we were in theory editors in chief, there were a lot of things that normally an editor in chief would have power over that we couldn't because there were five of us. And some things we might do would contradict the others or, you know, negatively affect the others. So Terry Stewart was going to be the ultimate be all and end all on anything that we, the five of us couldn't decide amongst ourselves. And Mm. so he, he held weekly meetings for a while where we'd go in there and we'd hit him with all the things that he needed to make decisions on. And usually he'd just say, okay, let me think about that. and I'll let you know next week. And then we'd meet him again the following week and have a whole bunch of new problems. And he'd never resolved the previous ones. So after a number of weeks of this, some of the other editors in chief just, They were wiser than I am, and they just gave up trying to get resolution on some of these things. Me and one of the other editor-in-chiefs kept a list of all the stuff that it was supposed to have been done and hadn't been done. And every week, we'd run through the list of things that should have been had decisions made, plus all the new stuff. And he started getting embarrassed by it. And his solution was to stop having the meetings. And I'm sure I didn't help my future there at all (laughs) by bringing up the fact that he was totally ineffective and (laughs) helping to get get anything done. But, you know, I felt that these decisions had to be made. There were people counting on me to get these decisions out of them. And I felt horrible that, you know, people that worked for me were being negatively affected by the indecisions at the top of the company. So I'm sure Terry, you know, has his own side of the story and has his own demons he was dealing with up there and all that. But if you're going to be president, be friggin' president, make some decisions. So they went back at the beginning of 95. They told us we had to cut staff by some outrageous amount. And I ended up having to lay off some people that I did not want to lay off. Then the year continued to not do well for the most part for Marvel. One of the few hits Marvel had in 95 was Marvel's which was edited by my former assistant, who was part of my group, Marcus McLaurin. And Marvel's happened because Marcus helped championing it. You know, when it was proposed to him, the writer had, again, sort of like a similar case, I think, to Stephen Grant up to that point. He hadn't done a lot that had really garnered a lot of attention, but the proposal was very, very interesting. And he brought along this guy, Alex Ross, who no one had ever heard of before. And Marcus championing this thing and got it approved in a period when the industry was starting to collapse and getting money for any new series was much harder, much less an expensive, fully painted series. And things like the production manufacturing people telling them that those clear acetate covers with the printing on them instead of printing on the the actual cover itself so that people had an you know, unobstructed view of the original Alex Ross painting on the cover. They kept telling him that was impossible. That was impossible. He never gave up. And he ended up searching out and finding people who could do that and showing it to the manufacturing people so they couldn't tell him no anymore. (laughs) And so his reward for having one of the few Marvel hits in 1995 was to be part of the huge wave of layoffs at 96, where they told a whole bunch of us, including me, that they were either fired or not renewing their contracts. So that Mm -hmm. was at the beginning of 96. So, Carl, if we don't get to Alien Legion, they're going to kill us. I mean, we, <laughs> like, yeah, we did two hours, but we did actually get to the thing that most people are probably know you for as much as anything. So can we take sure. a few minutes and talk about the genesis of that, how it came to be, what it means to you? Just, I'm going to let you just talk about that particular book and right. series and concept. All right. Well, that goes way, way back to when I was a fan trying to break into comics by drawing samples and sending them into the companies to be pretty much ignored. So I'd have to create my own scenarios to draw. I didn't want to just redraw something that had been part of a published comic. So at one point, I came up with two different stories. One was about this all-human space 
combat team, sort of a foreign legion in space, all made of humans. And a different story was about a, a couple different aliens, including one that had this serpentine lower body. And at some point, I accidentally knocked uh, the pages off my bed and they got scrambled on the floor. And as I was starting to sort them out, the light bulb went on over my head. And I said, these guys are in space, this combat crew. Why the hell are they all humans? The ranks should be filled with different you know, alien life forms. And they should be led by this guy with the serpentine lower body. And I never really had time to you know do much with that concept until you know 83 when i joined marvel and I, I didn't really have time to write it or draw it myself so i ended up hiring some people and working with them on it to develop it further and, and launch it and originally believe it or not that was going to be a marvel universe title really wow yeah marvel at that point if you created a new property that was going to be Marvel owned, then you were guaranteed through contract uh, a piece of the back end and so on if it ever got turned into a film or toys or whatever. But then this is one of the issues I had with Shooter. Shooter, you know, approved that and then he reneged on it. He decided he didn't want to do that after we'd already started working on the book. And so I was pretty ticked off. But then Archie Goodwin was just starting up at comics at the time. He comes over and he goes, I hear about this situation. How'd you like to bring it over to Epic? So Archie pretty much saved the day with that. And we ended up being the third Epic title after Dreadstar and Coyote. Oh, and, cool. Uh, and I think we were the longest running original Epic property of all time, if you count all the various editions and incarnations and all that. You know, there were a lot more issues of Gru, but Gru had been published at Pacific and somewhere else before they came to Epic. But I think it was the longest running title as, as far as number of issues and over the years of uh, any of the original Epic properties. But in 96, right before, 95, I guess it was, right before the layoffs at Marvel, I wrote a screenplay, my first screenplay with Fraley. And I didn't know anybody in the film business, but I... Occasionally, I would get calls from people saying, you know, I have something that might be interesting for me to shop around Hollywood. So eventually, in 96, it got optioned for a TV series at MGM that Bob Gale wrote the pilot for. Bob Gale's guy wrote all the Back to the Future films. Sure, he, he did some Daredevil, too, didn't you? Or Batman? Yeah, he, he did, yeah, yeah he, he's, he, he's a huge he's comics fan. fan. Yeah, yeah, huge comics fan. Very nice guy. Very talented guy. But then MGM decided they were getting out of the TV business, so that went away. And eventually, I hope I remember all these in order. This has a long history in Hollywood. The property was optioned eventually by Dimension Films, and they hired a really good writer to write it. But that writer didn't really know science fiction, and the draft that I read was very disappointing. And then the president of Dimension left, and the successors usually don't want to deal with their predecessors' projects. So that went away there. And then it got optioned by Mainframe, which was uh, doing 3D animation up in Canada. They were the guys that originally did Reboot. And uh -huh. they were getting more and more sophisticated with their work. And there was a, a producer on staff there that just loved Alien Legion. And so they optioned it and hired me to be executive editor. And I went out there and helped them develop it. And then that company's presidents changed hands. <laughs> Presidency changed hands. And the new president there screwed that on. And I can't remember if there are any others, but eventually a friend of mine who's a big comics fan, a, a writer and producer and, and a director named Boaz Keen, he directed Remember the Titans for Bruckheimer. Ah, and, that's the connection with Bruckheimer then, I guess. Yeah, he's written and directed a whole lot of films. Most of them are more indie-style films. The way we met is that he's the guy who wrote the first draft of the original Punisher film. And they'd sent that to me as the Punisher editor to get feedback on. And I sent them feedback and he contacted me directly to go over some of the feedback. And then they, he got removed from the project and they had somebody else rewrite it. But Boaz's original take on the character was much better than the one that ended up on the screen. But we were, you know, we became friends after that. And he'd gone into Bruckheimer's and they, had had success with the first couple of Pirates of the Caribbean films, mixing live action with CGI. And they wanted to do the same thing with the science fiction property. He goes, I got the perfect one for you. Sure. So, so they optioned Alien Legion, they optioned my screenplay, and, and 
they started a whole series of rewrites by half of Hollywood, basically. And this would be around 2007? Yeah, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Initially, they optioned it for two 18-month periods. But then in there, you have to add in, there was a writer's strike in there, too. So that automatically extends the period according to the terms of the contract. So they had it for about three plus years as an option. And then they hired the guy they thought was going to finally do the rewrite that they were looking for. And that was David Benioff of Ah, Game of Thrones fame. It turned out Benioff grew up in, this made me feel old, Benioff grew up in Brooklyn as a huge Alien Legion comics fan. And so between seasons of Game of Thrones, the busiest guy in Hollywood does three rewrites of Alien Legion. After uh, three rewrites, they fired him. And they didn't allow me to read any of his takes on it. Another guy that was a huge Alien Legion fan that had contacted me years before is Tim Miller, who owns Blur Studios and hadn't directed any feature films at the time, but had done a whole lot of very impressive work at his 3D studio there. And so I introduced him to the Bruckheimer people, but they didn't really want to entrust Alien Legion to someone who didn't have any feature credits yet. So right after you know Deadpool comes out, suddenly they're interested in Tim Miller. <laughs> same guy, same talent, just happens to have his first feature film to come out and be a big hit. So they let him read the last Benioff script. And it, according to him, he said it sounded kind of like they were instructing Benioff to turn Alien Legion into a science fiction Game of Thrones. So that didn't make any sense, and he wasn't interested in that. So that's when my contract was finally over with them. And in theory, I got the rights back. But Disney's contracts are pretty notorious for being onerous, and they have some pretty strange language in there that they're using now to help make it very difficult for me to make another deal elsewhere, although I'm I'm continuing to work on that now with some other production partners. So wish us luck. We're going to need it. Boy, that's discouraging, but a familiar story at the same time. Yep, afraid so. I'm also trying to get, I wrote a pilot for, and a Bible for a TV series based on my Last of the Dragons graphic novel. And I'm trying to, I've been writing screenplays on a variety of things over the years and I have pretty eclectic taste. So One of them is a baseball comedy. (laughs) One of them is that huge science fiction. I mean, that World War II project I told you about that's based on my family's experiences. I wrote Mm -hmm. a couple of screenplays about that one based on my family's experiences and one focused on the rescue effort to save them. Because I hadn't done enough work on spec, I combined them and added more to turn it into a TV miniseries script. And since my name's not Spielberg or Hanks, the odds of that ever getting made are pretty darn low. I wrote something called Yankee Maori, which is the true story of a an American in the 1860s who traveled to England, drank away all his money, and fell for a British recruiting army sergeant pitch about, you know, warm beds and warm food, and joined the British army, and got shipped to New Zealand. And he was a sarcastic authority-hating Yankee, which didn't go over well with his officers. So he was constantly being punished and flogged, and he deserts and joins the Maori in their fight against the British and ends up helping them win an unlikely series of victories over the British in in New Zealand in the 1860s. It's all real stuff I researched. That sounds great. I mean, that really sounds like fun. It's great stuff. I'm hoping to turn that into a graphic novel at some point, but finding someone who's interested in backing that is, is a little hard. Did you ever read that or see the Peter Jackson documentary? It's a fake documentary that he did, Forgotten Silver. Forgotten Silver? Yeah. No, what's that? What Jackson does early in his career, he does this faux documentary that's about a lost film that's discovered that reveals that there's a New Zealand director who is probably equal to D.W. Griffith and all that and was the the person that actually invented the close-up and and all of these things. And it's pretty authentic for at least a little bit of it, and then it gets a little more absurd as it goes along. I used to show it to my students and not explain to them that it was fake and it was meant to be be funny, and they would just be taking notes and uh, (laughs) following it. It's it's definitely worth watching, speaking in New Zealand. I'll, I'll check that out. The closest film I've seen to the Yankee Mara when I'm strapped on you about is Jeff, is it Miller? I forget the guy's name, but a New Zealand director 
He directed a film, I think it was in the 80s, called Utu, which means revenge. Oh, sure. Uh, yeah. And, you know, that has a lot of similarities to the period and the times I'm talking about. But, I, you know, I keep coming up with ideas and things that I like. And if I could find the time, I'll write them and work on them and uh, see what happens. Just things come out of the blue once in a while, too. Like, I was asked a while back by D.C., every once in a while they'll call me up and ask me to do layouts for someone else's work on that ground. Oh, cool. They hire people that they really like the drawing style for, but those people don't always tell the stories very clearly or cleanly, so they'll often hire people like me or John Bogdanov or Brett Blevins or Mike Manley to do the storytelling, the layouts for them. Well, Uh, you did literally write the book. Yeah, literally, yeah. (laughs) We should probably Uh, explain what I mean by that. I took a lot of the information and aspects and exercises and so on that I learned when I was mentoring a lot of talent at Marvel and wrote the book that came out that was part of the DC Comics Guide 2 series. There was, I think, about six of them all told. Mine was the most recent one. Denny O'Neill did the first one on writing, and then Klaus Jensen did one each on penciling and inking. There was one on digital tools by Fetty Williams and a split book on lettering and coloring by uh, Mark Giorello and Todd Klein. Yeah. On the lettering side. And then mine was on visual storytelling, but it also pretty much covered all the creative aspects. And recently that just went out of print. I was surprised because I usually, before I go to a convention, I'd call up the publisher and order a bunch of copies to take with me to sell. Cause I often give seminars on visual storytelling at the conventions I attend. And I was told that it was out of print. And I called up Watson Guthrie, who was the company that published it. They licensed it from DC Warner Brothers. And I was told that, I guess it was a 20-year deal they originally had. And it was up and Watson Guthrie was up for renewing it, but Warner Brothers pulled it. And that meant that all the copies that Watson Guthrie or Random House, their parent company, had in, in-house had to be trashed because it was a licensed book. They didn't own it they couldn't remainder it so so suddenly you know i can't get my own book anymore and i require it where i teach at school of visual arts and academy of art university and other places so my students can't even get my my you can't assign your own book now well i'll tell you off the phone how i'm handling that (laughs) but um (laughs) yeah so when i went to amazon the the few remaining new copies over there there's lots of you know used copies that you can find relatively reasonable but for a while there, they were up to $400 plus. And I'm going, who the hell's paying that for this book? But it, it's come down quite a bit since then. But there's not that many new copies left since they had to trash them all. I was really hoping they'd go remainder and I'd go buy a bunch of them cheap and use them that way. Well, we're at our time, but I didn't want to not ask you about your later career in terms of the teaching aspect. Could you talk about how you got started on that and what your experience has been as a teacher? I've always been, obviously, you know, from the time I mentored at Marvel, I've always been interested in working and trying to help people get better at creating comics and all the creative aspects. And I was having lunch, I guess, about nine years ago with Klaus Jansen, who's taught for a long time at School of Visual Arts in New York, and mentioned my interest in teaching. So he put the word into the chair, the head of the the chairman of the division, illustration division, and they ended up having me come on board to help teach senior portfolio class. And eventually I got into, I created a new class that where students bring their ideas for their story worlds and their fictional worlds. And we create a Bible around it that fleshes out the world, works out the internal logic, who the characters are, the storylines, do character designs and environment designs and so on. So they have this pitch Bible that they can use to either go to publishers or producers or whatever with. And I'm also teaching a junior thesis class now. I co-teach that one with Joey Cavalieri, who uh, worked at both Marvel and DC. And I teach online now as well for Academy of Art University, which is based out in San Francisco, but they have a lot of online classes. And it's a little strange teaching online, but the plus side is I get to teach people all around the world. There's times when I've taught, you know, like a soldier during his downtime who's stationed in Iraq, you know, people in Romania, people in South America, you know, people all over the U.S. that I would never, in Canada, that I'd never get a chance to, to meet or teach or learn from myself. 
it's definitely strange to be teaching online in some ways, but uh, very gratifying in others. And I teach a little bit here in New York at Manhattanville College occasionally. And I wrote a course recently for Pace University on writing and editing graphic novels. So I like it. I enjoy it a lot. It's a lot of work. I wish teaching paid more. That would be nice. But I noticed, uh, I saw the word adjunct in front of some of your stuff, and I thought, well, I know what that means, which means grossly underpaid. (laughs) And the big difference between mentoring at Marvel and teaching is that when I was mentoring at Marvel, I could cherry pick the best, most talented people and work with them. When you're teaching, you have to move everybody forward as much as they can, no matter what level they start at, what their level of dedication or enthusiasm is. It's your job to try and move them forward as much as possible. And that's a much more difficult task, particularly when there's so many of them in the the classroom. And that's a real challenge. And I think I have a fair amount of success on it, but I'd always, the, the times where it's not as successful as I'd like, that's very disappointing. Have you encountered anybody where you just thought, it doesn't matter what you're going to be, you're going to be a super successful person in the industry? Well, what's interesting now is the vast majority of my students are not at all interested in mainstream comics. They're more indie. And thankfully, I've always had an eclectic you know, sense of taste and interest. And having started myself out at, you know, at Epic Illustrated Magazine, doing things that weren't super heroic stuff at all. But a, a lot of them are just not interested in mainstream comics. There are a few. One of them, one of my better actually continuing ed classes students, is helping me now uh, with the latest DC project where they wanted to do, they wanted me to do 175 pages of layouts for a Catwoman graphic novel coming up. And I just didn't have the time to do it. So I talked them into letting one of my top students do that with my supervision. Oh, and, that's uh, great. And, and we're getting close to the finish on that. But uh, there's a lot of people that are really talented that haven't quite made it big yet in the indie or the mainstream area yet, but I think we'll be seeing a lot of them come soon. There's just so many talented people, and they love creating comics so much. A lot of them do it for, you know, just for the sheer love of doing it, even if they know they can never make a living at it. The irony of the business right now is that it's, you know, never been more diverse in genres or subjects than it ever has been before in North America, but the actual sales of print comics, and even if you factor in the digital ones, it's a you know a fraction of what it used to be in the heyday of the late 80s, early 90s. When I joined Marvel, we would routinely cancel books that sold less than 100,000 copies. If a book sold 25,000 copies now, that people would be running down the hall shouting for joy that this thing sold that much. Right. That's a very different industry today, that's yeah. for sure. But the whole online medium, that gives everybody that wants to publish their work, you know, an outlet for it now. It's just hard to figure out how you're going to monetize it. That's the, the huge bugaboo. And some of my favorite comics I've read in the last couple of years have been t- when taking my six-year-old to the children's bookstore. And some of the stuff uh-huh. that Scholastic and, and those publishers yeah. are doing for a second is really top stuff Yeah, uh, and very, very I, different. My favorite graphic novel I've read in like the last five years is the first second graphic novel by the Tamaki Cousins this one summer. I think that's a brilliant piece of work. Oh, I love that. Yeah. yeah. And uh, any time I run into somebody that isn't familiar with the graphic novel form or thinks it's all, you know, Batman, Spider-Man stuff, I actually buy groups of used copies of this one summer that I keep on hand. And I just hand them to them. And I make converts all the time by handing them that book. That's a great one. The Prince and the Dressmaker. There's uh, some that are just beautiful books. So I have some hope for the industry. I love today's talk. Thanks so much, Carl. You give a lot of insight because you come at it as a professional, as an academic, and then you're really well-spoken where you can actually sum up complex emotional situations in a way that people can understand. I really appreciate your talent and your ability to chat with us today. Yeah, uh, nicely said. I feel the same. It was great. Carl, really fun. I'm glad you guys enjoyed it. I did too. Oh, good. So this is another episode of the Comic Book Historians podcast. I'm Alex Sharon with my co-host, Jim Thompson. Carl Potts, thanks for joining us today. And stay tuned for our next episode in a couple of weeks. Cheers. <laughs>